You know, when I talk to groups of youngsters, which I do a lot, I love to talk to high schoolers and to college-age kids, I ask them a simple question. The question is, what are you best at? Not what are you good at, but what are you best at? Better than 99.9% .9 of the world, which still means you have a whole lot of company, but what are you absolutely best at? What's your core competency? For everyone in this room, that answer is different. But for everyone in this room, your job is to build the future with whatever that competency is. So my role today is to help you do that, to help you build on that competency and as a result to create a future, a future worth living in, a future worthy of our kids. That's a tough thing to do, especially at times like this. And we talk about innovation, we talk about it all the time, but I'm not sure we understand exactly what it is. So I want to begin at the outset by bursting the bubble because there are a lot of myths about innovation what it does, what it, what it, how it helps us, how it improves the human condition. And I'm not sure in all cases we do the right things in the name of innovation. How many of you believe this quote? How many of you believe this quote? I'm going to tell you who said this at the very end of the presentation. But you know what? We always have the arrogance to believe that all the good stuff has already been discovered. My daughter said to me a few days ago, you know, Dad, I wish I was born mm, 50 years ago because I could have discovered all the great stuff that today I use. And you know, at her age, I felt the same way. All the good stuff has been figured out. I could have invented a light bulb. How difficult could that be? Right? Once we're there, once the behavior changes, once we have the iPods and the iPhones, we, we forget what it was like before, and we trivialize it. Because it's not this. This is not the innovation. The innovation is the way behavior changes. And that's the job you're in. The job you're in is not to create technology. The job you're in is to create a change in behavior. And boy, that's a tough thing to do. And that's what I want to focus you on today. How do we change the behaviors that ultimately create more value for our organizations, for ourselves, for the world at large, and for the five billion or so people who have yet to even experience the stuff that we call technology? So in a word, and I want you to give me one word, in a word, answer this question. In one word. Yell it out. What's the word? Yell it out. Work with me. Innovation is one suggestion. What else? Change. What else? Visionary. Passion. All good words. All great words. Let me make it a little bit tougher for you. Same word applies to this question as well. What's the word? Complacency. Complacency. <laughs> Imagination. Self. Self. I'll give you a suggestion. Because I think if you go back, I don't care how far back in time you go, and I don't care how far forward you want to roll the clock, one word in my mind ultimately determines how innovative we are and how we figure our way out of our problems and it is how well we can connect. It is the J-curve of not just our generation, but I think civilization at large. How well we connect ultimately determines how well we can define the future, how well we can define the future, and how we can survive that future. And this is fundamentally the tool we have to innovate with today the way that we connect. And we'll talk about social networking. Carlos will talk a whole lot about some great technologies that are allowing you to connect in ways that we couldn't have even imagined five or 10 years ago. But at the end of the day, it's all about how we connect with each other and what we do with those connections. So I'm going to ask you a question. I want to show you how difficult it is to sometimes put in place these extraordinarily simple concepts. I want you to picture in your mind's eye an image of the world. Simple question, right? Picture an image of the world. Have you got it? Freeze frame. So I was asked this question years ago by a friend. And I thought to myself, boy, you know, my view of the world has a lot to do with how I approach the problems that I solve. And that view is frozen in time. In fact, this is my view of the world. 
How many of you, when I ask that question, this is the map that hung in my grade school classroom, and in fact, across the Eurasian continent, my view still had the USSR emblazoned. How many of you had this in your mind's eye when I said, picture an image of the world? Raise your hand. I'm not the oldest one in the room. I know I'm not. How many of you had this kind of a view in your mind's eye? Amazing, isn't it? The Apollo moonshots did so much to define the world for us. How many of you had a Google Earth view? How many? Anyone? A few of you. You know, I did this just a few weeks ago to a large group of 20-somethings. 90% of the room put their hands up for Google Earth. Our view of the world is not a connected view. It is an isolationist view of the world. Kids today see a world in motion. They really do not understand, appreciate, or have any consideration for borders or boundaries in a way that I think you know, absolutely astounds us and befuddles us often. This very simple notion of how you see the world I think has more to do with how we innovate than anything else, and let me prove it to you. Most often, we use innovation and invention synonymously, and they are completely different things. Invention creates no value whatsoever. Invention is an idea on a shelf. Innovation creates value. And the problem we've gotten ourselves into from an ecological standpoint, from a technology standpoint, from an organizational standpoint, social standpoint, is because we've too often confused invention with innovation. The two are completely separate. Innovation creates value. It doesn't just create more stuff. We've got plenty of stuff. And if you don't believe that, boy, on your flight home, take a look at the Sky Mall catalog. All right? Have you ever looked through one of these? And you know, you do it because there's nothing else to do while the, you're waiting for a plane to take off. And as you're looking through, I say, my God, I really need that. I never thought I did, but right now I really do. That's invention. We need it. Why? I had the most astute question I've ever had asked, asked a few weeks ago by the same group of 20-somethings. At the end, a fellow raised his hand and said, said, Mr. Kalopoulos, are there things that we shouldn't invent? Ah, boy, isn't that a great question? Because we never asked that. Why do I invent it? Because I can. Do I need more reason to invent than that? It's not a good enough reason. Just because you can invent doesn't mean you should. Innovation is about creating value. So let's play a little game, shall we? You all know Deal or No Deal, right? Great show. Absolutely cutting in terms of its illustration of the pure greed of human psychology. So I am going to change the rules on you a little bit. I'm going to play my version of it, which is called Real or Not. I'm going to show you a few things I've actually pulled out of the SkyMall catalog, in some cases, and ask you if they are real. So here's a device that attaches your laptop to your steering wheel. I've been collecting these for years and years. <laughs> I love the heads-up display, right? Someone was talking about the heads-up heads -up display in their BMW last night. I don't need a BMW. i got a heads-up display right here. Look at that. 40 bucks. I don't know how that ever justifies the liability associated with using this product, but nonetheless. Real or not real? How many say it's real? Absolutely. How many have one? Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. This next one, I, I, I love this. A USB cup warmer, which, by the way, you can plug into your laptop while it's attached to your steering wheel, right? For that coffee on the go. Real or not real? How many say it's real? Absolutely. Positively. And if you're really in a rush, how about plugging in your USB toaster to the USB cup warmer? Right. That one is a spoof. I'll give you that one. But they get better. How about the e-holster? This is not for guns and such, ammunition and what have you. This is for your PDA, your cell phone, your portable keyboard, made out of wonderful ballistic nylon or leather, for those of you that want to make a fashion statement as well. And I'm just waiting for someone to wear one of these through TSA security. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Someday when I have a lot of time on my hands. Go to eholster.com. You too can have one of these. All right. Real or not real on the e-holster? Who says it's real? Yeah, you betcha. And after we're done, you'll probably go out and buy one. I'm sure you will. The Microsoft ILU, the internet-enabled porta potty Wait, this gets really good. Take a close look because 
It's got an internet connection on the inside and also on the outside. Picture this. Everything okay in there? Everything's fine. <laughs> real or not real? Who says it's real? All right, but it's a good idea, you would admit, right? Okay. This, I actually got this out of the SkyMall catalog, the latest edition. Coming on the plane, I, I, I actually went online and grabbed this just for you. This is, you ever try to reach for your cell phone, you don't know quite where it is? This permanently attaches the cell phone to your wrist. And look at how marvelous this device is. Isn't that fantastic? We are, we are suffering, as a species, we are suffering because of our relentless ability to invent. Right? We are at a point in time where we are under so much pain, you know, the single largest category of pharmacological agents is analgesics, pain-relieving medicines. It is the fastest growing category and has been for 20 years because as a society, we're in pain. We're in pain because of our inventiveness. And all this stuff does not create more value. Just one last one for kicks and giggles. And by the way, the fact that the remote control is attached to your head does not mean you will not lose it, at least in my case. <laughs> All right. So have I made the point? Innovation is not invention. The two are entirely separate things. And you have to divorce one from the other if you want to start building the future. And it's a tough thing to do. You know, we, we don't get this right very often. Today there are 3.3 billion cell phones in the world. 3.3 billion active cell phones in the world. What an incredible number. You know, when Motorola first came out with the cell phone, their projections for usage of cell phones in and around this period of time, anyone want to guess how many cell phones they thought would be used worldwide? 300 million. Anyone else? 3 million. It's less than a million. Less than a million cell phones. How do we get the future that wrong? How do we get it that wrong? Because it's not about the technology. This is not an iPod. This is a behavior. The Blackberry is not a technology. It's a behavior. You cannot project the trajectory of behavior. You can project the trajectory of technology, but you cannot project the trajectory of behavior. It's like projecting the trajectory of a dust cloud. It can't be done. There are too many elements at play. So I love to subscribe to this wonderful publication, and every so often I'll leave it on the kitchen table, and my daughter will pick it up. She's 15 now, and she loves to read about this stuff. And a few years back, I got this issue, which had Maxwell Smart in the cover. This was about the same time the new Maxwell Smart movie was coming out. And my daughter saw it. She wasn't familiar with the whole Maxwell Smart genre, and she looked at it. She said, Dad, what the hell is he doing talking into his shoe? I said, well, that, he was a secret agent. I gave her the whole, you know, the background, the context. And he talked to new shoe because, you know, that's what his phone was. It was built into a shoe. And she said, no, no, I, I don't get it. Why isn't he using his cell phone? I said, no, no, he didn't have a cell phone. This is what we thought cell phones would look like. And by the way, in all of our brilliance, there's a dial on that shoe, not even a touchpad. This is what we thought cell phones would look like. Why do we get the future that wrong? You cannot project behavior. And when you get stuck, when you get stuck in time, when your lens, that image of the world gets stuck, it doesn't get stuck because of a technology. You know, we can all use Twitter, but do we get Twitter? Do we understand the behavior of Twitter? And that's the question behind all innovation, is how is behavior changed? And how can we adapt to that behavior? How many of you use Twitter? Not even half. It's amazing, right? Not even half. So here's why you should use Twitter. Not because it's a wonderful technology, but because the only way to stay young is by understanding the behavior of those who use the technology. And my suggestion to you is put up with the pain, the pain of the technology, just to understand the behavior behind it.